Well, tonight, Eli and his sons, as you would expect, is really going to be a tragic opening to this study, but it does finish with a bright note. But let's just have a look at what happens now as we've read through that reading. What would have happened to Israel if Hannah had not prayed for a son? What would have happened if Eli had been succeeded by his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas? But Yahweh's divine intervention saved the nation from this rulership by two worthless sons. And Hophni and Phinehas were already anticipating their father's death and they were ignoring all his remonstrations. They were doing exactly what they thought they could do in the ecclesial environment. Let's just set the scene a little bit and just have a look at how old Eli was so we can get a feel of what it was like for young Samuel. Now we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 15, if you just join with me there please, in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 15, that Eli was 98 years of age when the ark was taken. Verse 18, and it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell back from off the seat backwards that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died and he was an old man. I've got the wrong verse. I want verse 15. But it says, Now Eli was 90 and 8 years old and his eyes were dim that he could not see. Eli was 98 years of age. Pretty old. You think of some of the oldest people we know in Maranatha that can hardly move themselves around. Here's Eli. He's still the priest. And he's still the judge in Israel. Now he was very old when Samuel came to him in chapter 2 and verse 22. We read, And Eli was very old. Now we don't know how old he was, but we do know that Samuel had just been weaned when he was presented to Eli, and Eli was very old then. And, and Samuel was around about four years of age, around about four years of age. The battle when the ark was taken, what we just read about in chapter 4, and God's judgments against Eli's house happened after God had revealed it to Samuel. In chapter 3, look at chapter 3 and verse 11 to 15. Now God reveals this to the young Samuel, and I believe Samuel here, when he reveals this to him, it would have been only about 12 years of age. And Yahweh said to Samuel, 1 Samuel 3 verse 11, Yahweh said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all those things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of Yahweh, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Now, Eli had been told that previously, those words. But just think about it. Only little 12-year-old boys out here in the audience, to receive that message and to know that you're, you're actually going to have to reveal that to a man who's around about well, about 85 years of age, would be pretty pretty daunting. Now, we're not given the age of Samuel at this time, but Jewish tradition places him at around about 12 years of age when he would have been able to comprehend this. Now, if Josephus is correct, then Eli would have been around about 85 years of age when this message came, when, when he heard Hannah's prayer. An 85-year-old man, when he heard Hannah's prayer and if we look, if we just work this backwards, how I arrived at that, he was 98 at his death. Samuel, around about 12 years of age, plus one year for his conception, takes us back to about 85 years of age when he received Samuel into the tabernacle. Now, I've just gone to that trouble just to explain to you so you get the feeling that here's an, you're giving this little boy that you love to a man who's 85 years of age and he's got these two worthless sons. That's the environment that Samuel's placed into. So here he is. Now, why was Eli the judge and the priest in Israel? We're actually told that in that chapter 
4 and verse 18 that he had judged Israel for 40 years. So that means that, that Eli had started as a judge and a priest at 58 years of age. Now, he enters the, the scriptural record with no real introduction. We're not told what happened. It's unusual for a man to become a priest at 58 years of age. In fact, the priests retired at 50 years of age. So the high priests in Israel were the descendants of Aaron's son, Eliezer. But Eli was in the line of Eliezer's younger brother, Ithamar. He wasn't even in the line of Eliezer or of Aaron, or of um, Eliezer. According to Josephus, he was a descendant by his, not of Eliezer, but by Eli was of the family of Ithamar. Now that's significant. I'll just put that on a chart so you can understand what that's all about. So if you just look at the priesthood here, Nadab and Abihu, we know, were, were destroyed because of offering a strange fire. Aaron was the appointed high priest and his sons were to be the high priestly family. And the line followed Eliezer, Phineas, Abishah, Bukai and Azai. And then you can see Ithamar, the other son, of Aaron over to the side there. Now, for some reason, the priesthood transferred from Uzai to Eli. Now, Eli was, don't forget, 58 years of age. The priesthood is transferred to him. Now, actually, I'll be bringing this chart up from time to time. Just to, it, it, It's got a lot to do with the prophecies concerning the priesthood. So we need to Look at this chart, and this, this is the first time we'll see it, but we're going to see it from time to time. So the priesthood was transferred to the household of Ithamar, and it continued in the household of Ithamar. Hophni and Phineas were slain in the battle through Ahiotub, Ahimelech, and Abiathar. And if you remember that Abiathar was eventually rejected by Solomon because he had done the wrong thing. Now, and the priesthood then reverted back to Zadok. So in fact, there was a time in Israel when you actually had two priesthoods, when, and we'll come to that eventually. When David was sitting on the throne, he had 16 sons of Zadok and eight sons of Ithamar who were surrounding his throne as the elders or the priests on the throne. But the point we're just coming to at the moment is, for some reason, the priesthood transferred from the descendants of Eliezer across to the descendant of Ithamar, and Eli was there at 58 years of age. So something must have happened. Uh, we, we're not sure, we're not told in Scripture what happened, but the priesthood was transferred to the other family. It didn't last there, but it was transferred there. Now, possibly one of the reasons why it was transferred, there might have been a problem with somebody, uh, a defect, in Eliezer's descendants. Now, just want you to come to this passage in Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21, verse 17, speak unto Aaron, Leviticus 21, 17, speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. So the priesthood and the, and the descendants of Eliezer must have had some problem, maybe a blemish, and it was transferred across to the house of Ithamar. Now we just, we've got a, 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 what these blemishes were on the screen. We just need to make the point, brethren and sisters, it's not a reflection on people who have got physical limitations. Certainly it was in the days of the priesthood, but the spiritual lessons will come. Let's just read the next verse, verse 18. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. A blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken footed, or broken handed, or crooked backed, or a dwarf, or he that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken? No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of Yahweh made by fire, 
he hath a blemish and shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. But it says in verse 22, he shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy. Only, verse 23, he shall not go into the, into the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I, Yahweh, do sanctify them. So God is saying he doesn't reject the person or the man from eating of the, the, breast, the, the bread that was given to the priest, the, the support the, the, and the nurture that was given to the priest. That He wasn't rejected from that, but he could not take the role of the high priest. And what it's saying to us, brethren, there are spiritual lessons in this, and here they are, brethren and sisters. For those who aspire to be kings and priests, and really that's all of us in a way, that's all of us. And one passage I don't have on the screen, I'd like you to join with me in Hebrews chapter 5. It's a great passage about the, what, a, what characteristics a priest should have. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And verse 2. Who can have compassion on the ignorant? Now, here's the characteristics of a priest. Somebody who can have compassion on the ignorant and on those that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And, of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was compassed with infirmity. He was the same nature as you and I. He was able, by, the, by, the, by that, what he was, his nature, he is able to extend compassion to us. He can sorrow with us and he can support those that are out of the way. So the priest's role was a role to support those that were in need. Now, I just made that point. Let's come back to Leviticus 21, because when we read this, it may seem a little bit lopsided, but God is saying he requires holiness in all those who aspire to be his priests. And we may not be able to manifest all of these characteristics, but this is the ideal. This is what God wants us to do. Back in Leviticus 21 and verse 17, it says, a person that is blind and they're typical of moral failings. So a person who cannot see the way of the truth cannot administer for Yahweh as a priest. A person who is lame, that's a person who cannot walk in the way. A person who's got a flat nose, well, what does that really mean? It, it's supposed to mean an appearance of evil. Somebody's got a flat nose, and I hope nobody's got a flat nose. <laughs> I've got a very pointed one, but uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it, it's supposed to, and this is the idea that conveys the appearance of an evil face. Something that is superfluous, that means something which is stretched out. A person who takes the word of God and makes philosophies out of it, stretches it out and distorts the word of God. Or somebody that's broken footed or broken handed, somebody that's. They can't be a priest if they can't stand and help in the day of trouble. Or if they're crooked-backed, one that is bent over and cannot illustrate in life the principles of righteousness. A person that is a dwarf, the word means small or wasted, and that's one that finds it difficult to be direct and there is a need for, for leadership for a for assertive leadership, Christ-like leadership, but assertive leadership for those who aspire to be priests. One that's got a blemished eyes, that is somebody who cannot see the word of God clearly. Someone who's got scurvy, and that's a disease that starts in the head and then finds its way down through the body. It's, it's typical of sin, starts in our mind and then affects the way we live. So somebody who had scurvy could not act as a priest, or somebody who was scabbed. And that's the effects that come from this, this scurvy sin or broken stones. And that's somebody who cannot reproduce the word of God. Now, those people could not be priests. And may have, it may have been the reason why it passed from the, the line of Eliezer across to the descendants of Ithamar. We don't know. 
But that's the only reason that we're given that the priesthood could be changed or someone could be barred from being a priest. But he could still eat of the bread. He was still supported by Yahweh. Whatever the reason was, Eli would realise that God required sanctity. In verse 8 of Leviticus 21, it says, Thou shalt sanctify him, that's the high priest, therefore he, for he offereth the bread of God, he shall be holy unto thee, for I, Yahweh, for I am, for I, Yahweh, which sanctify you, am holy. So the priest had to manifest holiness, a sanctity, a separate way of life, a way of God manifestation. Now, I'm only suggesting that this has happened, but whatever it was, something happened, and now the priesthood passed across to Eli, a 58-year-old man, and he starts the role of priest and the role as a judge. But as we've already seen, at 58, he, and as he got older, he became slack in the things of the truth, and we find him, and you've seen these slides, he sat, we're told, in chapter 1 by a doorpost, and we saw that priests were not to sit but to stand and to serve, and there were no seats in the tabernacle. And in fact, we saw that the word was a throne. He sat on a throne and he took his position. He, he, he aspired to a rulership instead of a compassionate priest. So serving brethren in the ecclesia are not rulers of the ecclesia. They're to be compassionate, serving brethren. And Eli got it all wrong. And he became this ruler with his two evil sons. He wasn't able to see the errors of his son. He was unable to assess the spiritual qualities of those who came into the temple. He got it all wrong with Hannah. He thought she was a drunken woman. And as we saw, he types the apostasy. And that's what happened to Christadelphians. 300 years from the time of the Lord Jesus Christ to the year 312, Christadelphians became the Roman Catholic Church. They apostatized from the truth. They became complacent. And that's what happened to Eli. He was becoming complacent with the things of the word of God. So now when we come back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, we find that his sons are referred to as sons of Belial. Verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not Yahweh. The word Belial means worthless. They were, they were just worthless men. And we see people like that in the world, don't we? I mean, we, we see lots of people out there that are wicked and worthless people. But here were men who were priests of God. And they had no regard for Yahweh. And here's young Samuel. He's placed right in the middle of all that. A little boy of four years of age. And we can contrast those two characters. Eli's sons treated the priestly office with contempt. Samuel reveres it. Little boy, but he reveres the priestly office. Samuel's, Eli's sons disrespected him. Samuel respected Eli in spite of his faults. Eli did rebuke his boys, but Samuel was affirmed positively by Eli. Hophni and Phinehas ignored Yahweh. Samuel listened to Yahweh. There is a prophecy against Hophni and Phinehas, and God calls Samuel a prophet. Hophni and Phinehas were defeated by the Philistines, and Samuel leads the defeat of the Philistines. Hophni and Phinehas die in battle, but Samuel judges Israel for well over 80 years, and he dies peacefully. So great contrast between those two boys and the young boy Samuel. Now when we come to the offering here, in verse 13, we read, And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, and this was a, a peace offering, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething, while it was boiling in the pot, with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. So the, the priests were told, custom. And the word custom really means it became a decree. Hophni and Phinehas actually made this a law. Now, you bring this offering in, we're going to take as much as we like. Now, they were not to do that. 
But that's the decree that they made. The priests were entitled to a part of this offering, but not what Hophni and Phinehas were taking. We're told there that they sent a servant. Now, that's not Samuel. It's, it's another young boy. So there are other young boys in the service in the tabernacle. So he was a young boy, a young servant. He was sent to do the dirty work for, for Hophni and Phinehas. And this is the environment that Samuel was in. Other young boys were there and Samuel's there seeing what's going on. He had, he had to survive in that environment and survive he did. Now, as I said, this was a peace offering. Just read on in verse 14. And he struck it in the three-pronged fork, into the pan or the kettle or the, or the cauldron or the pot. All that the flesh hook brought up for the priest, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh until all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if any man said unto them, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer them and say, Nay, but thou shalt give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Now this, this offering, as I said, that they, they brought to the priest, in this instance, was a peace offering. And there was a part that the priest could partake of and a part that was put on the altar, two parts. But the part, let's just go across to Leviticus chapter 7. We'll have a look at a close look at this offering and see what was going on here. So it was a peace offering that had to be waived. I'll explain what that means in a moment. But Eli's sons were un they were not satisfied with the part that they were getting. But we just read in, in Leviticus chapter 7 and verse 28. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, He that offereth the sacrifice of his peace offerings unto Yahweh shall bring his oblation unto Yahweh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. Now, verse 28, that word oblation is the word gift. So when someone brought an offering to Yahweh, it was a gift. Brings a gift to Yahweh. Verse 30, his own hands shall bring the offering of Yahweh made by fire, the fat with the breast, and he shall bring it that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before Yahweh. Now, it was a wave offering. Now, that meant there were two pieces. There was the breast and there was the thigh, which was the, the foreleg of the beast. And the breast had to be held in the hand like that. The offerer would hold it in the hand. And as you can see on the screen, the priest would hold under his hand and it would be waved like that from the priest back to the altar, from the priest to the altar. And it was called a wave offering. And it was designed to teach that this offering, this gift that was given by the person, was given through the high priest and the high priest was giving it to God. That's what it was teaching. So the high priest was helping the offerer. He had his hands under his hands. And you see, that's, that's in type, the lesson for us, brethren and sisters, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our high priest. We bring offerings. We bring our gifts to God. We try to make offerings in our life to God. And we work through our priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as though he takes our hands and he helps us to offer those gifts to God. You know, we've got that passage in the New Testament where it says, if we bring our gift to the altar on a Sunday morning and we've got aught against our brother or our sister, then we're to take, uh, leave our gift there and we're to go away and we're to reconcile ourselves with our brother and sister before we come back to that memorial table or to that altar. And that, that passage in Matthew is, is based on this principle here in Leviticus chapter 7. It's based on the principle that we are working, our high priest is helping us. Now, the breast spoke of the, the inner part of the, the heart of the person. The person was giving their heart, their, their, their heart to God. 
and their the right thigh, the right thigh of the beast, the strength, you, if you remove the right thigh of a beast, it will fall over. So it's, it talks about activity and strength. We're to give our strength and activity to Yahweh in service. So we read on. And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, verse 31, and his breast shall be Aaron's. You see, the priest could keep a bit, and his sons, and the right shoulder shall he give unto the priest. The priest could also keep the right shoulder for a heave offering of the sacrifice of your peace offerings. Just coming down to verse 34, for the wave breast and the heave shoulder have I taken of the children of Israel from off the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them unto Aaron the priest and unto his sons. I want you to know this point. By a statute forever, from among the children of Israel. So it wasn't something that was just in the law of Moses, you threw the law of Moses out. Here's a statute forever. And God's saying to us, he wants us in making our peace with him and working with our great high priest to make offerings, to offer our lives, our hearts, our strength of our lives to him in service. And it's a wave offering. And we are assisted by the priest as this offering is waved. So that's what the wave offering means. Now, that's laid the background to what's actually going on here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Because you see, Hophni and Phineas were supposed to get the shoulder and the breast, but they wanted the whole lot. And maybe, maybe Eli was getting some of this too because we're told that he was a big and he was a fat man who was heavy. Maybe he was getting plenty of meat. And they were taking the fat also. You see, it was the principle. That's the way they treated their brethren. They were very, very coarse men. And we need to be careful we don't treat our brethren like that. And so they, we say Hophni and Phinehas committed the additional injustice of sending servants to take the, away these portions. They didn't even do it themselves. They got others to do the dirty work for them. And faithful Israelites were revolted at such an action. It really brought a bad name on the truth. It turned people away. You know, people would be saying, well, if that's how Christadelphians are, I don't want to have anything to do with them. And that happens, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? Sometimes people do wrong things and it brings the truth into disrepute. And you've probably all heard people say, well, if that's what the truth is all about, I don't want to have any part of it. We've got to be careful what we do. People need to be very careful about what they can bring uh, upon the household. Let's come back to um, 1 Samuel 2. Here's just another translation of that section of taking the fat. Verse 16. Here's another translation of verse 16. If any man said to him, First let the fat be burned, then take as much as you will. Then the servant would say, no, you give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. And the people objected to that sort of action. You know, any action in ecclesial life that, that is forced upon people is wrong action. The, the, the wave offering was an offering of love, of giving oneself in dedication. But these men were besmirching that offering. They were besmirching the truth, bringing it into ill repute. And so it says, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before Yahweh, for men abhorred the offering of Yahweh. It's like us saying today, men abhorred Christadelphians because of what they were doing. And so the truth can be brought into disrespect because of bad behaviour. We've got these examples here. We know them. Simeon and Levi, what they did to the people of the land. And Jacob said, look, you make my, my name to stink in the land. He, they, they got all the, the people to be, the, the Gentiles in that area, to be circumcised, and then they went and killed them all. A very evil thing. And actually, Simeon and Levi are referred to as, in the promises in Genesis 49, as instruments of cruelty. And yet the priesthood came out of Levi. David and Bathsheba. Have a look at this one in 2 Samuel 12.
We know the incident of David and Bathsheba, but this is what Nathan says at the end of it, in verse 14. He says, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of Yahweh, Yahweh to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So we need to be very careful, brethren and sisters, what we do out there in the world, what we do in our every work a day. People know we are Christadelphians. People watch what we do. And we're not to bring the truth into disrepute. Cost David dearly. And it will cost us dearly. National Israel did the same. Israel rulers, the priesthood in Malachi's day, and Israel did the same to the nations. God said to the nation of Israel, you are my chosen people. You are my peculiar people. But they just besmirched God's name amongst the nations. So as Christadelphians, brethren and sisters, we need to be very careful that we bear the name and we honour that name. and We don't besmirch the truth by our actions. So when we come back to 2 Samuel and verse 2, it goes on to say in contrast, but Samuel ministered before Yahweh, being a child girded with a linen ephod. The sin of the young men was very great, but Samuel continued to minister in all of this. Now, you wouldn't put your family into that environment, but there he was, and he survived, and he grew. The impact of his mother and the mind of that young boy. We're told that he was girded with a linen ephod. Now this linen ephod was a little coat that his mother made for him year by year. And as you can see on the screen there, it's, it's symbolical of, of the garments that we wear. The, we're clothed upon with the truth. We're to keep our garments. Samuel's mother made this little coat for him year by year. But it really was, the word actually means an upper garment. It was the upper garment that a priest wore. Now Samuel was not a priest. But we're coming to see something about Samuel now, that he was not he was not a descendant of Aaron, and only the descendants of Aaron could be priests. But Samuel, really in his life, acted out, and you'll see more of this as we go through this, really acted out the role of a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He really was a priest of another order. And so he was, this little boy. He wore this robe, but it was a priestly robe. And she made it from year to year. So she was a wise mother that provided for the covering of her children, as all wise mothers do. But you know this code, I want you to come to this passage in 1 Samuel 28, 14. Samuel was recognized. He always wore this coat, not only as a little boy, but all his life. And even in his death, he was recognized as wearing this coat. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 14. Now, it's about the witch of Endor. I'm not going to uh, give an in-depth explanation about the witch of Endor. There are a number. We, uh, obviously, there's no such thing as a witch that has got supernatural powers. We know that. Scriptural teaching quite clearly tells us that. But this woman did see Samuel. Now, she either saw a vision or God raised Samuel up. I choose to believe that God raised Samuel up in response to Saul's foolishness. Verse 14, and what? And she, she sees, she's surprised. This woman who was supposed to be hiding as a witch and, and Saul went to her, she calls out, we're told in verse 14, and he said unto her, what form is he of, this Saul says. And she said, an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle. That word mantle is the same word for the little coat that Samuel wore. The high priest covering, the high priest coat. Even in this vision or in this resurrection, he comes up and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. So it's the same word as you can see on the screen there. The word meal is associated with the robe of righteousness. So he, wherever he went, his mother started to make them for him. But from there on, Samuel wore that little coat. And so I just say on the screen, well, what about the witch of Endor? Well, God raised up Samuel for the occasion in order to rebuke a fool, Saul, according to his folly. 
And this accounts for the precise prediction she made and her sudden cry when suddenly confronted with the unexpected. She, she wasn't expecting to see Samuel and she did see him. We can talk about that later, but we know there's no such thing as a witch with supernatural powers. And so here she was. He was back in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're told, verse 19, Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it up to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So she planned, you know, she's, she's back there for 12 months and while she's away, she's planning for her family, planning for her son. And the lesson for us is that we need to plan for our families, plan our life in the ecclesia. Ecclesial life, and we all know it, requires organisation. You, you just don't sort of breeze along and go here and go there. We have to commit ourselves to personal Bible study. We have to commit ourselves to attending Bible classes and, and all of the meetings. We have to commit ourselves to supporting the brethren. It requires commitment and it requires organisation. And with little children, that starts with mothers who organise those children and they grow into adults and become responsible members of the ecclesia. Then we read verse 21. And Yahweh visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters, and the child Samuel grew before Yahweh. So she had three sons and two daughters, five, the number of grace. God was gracious to her. But including Samuel now, six children. And Samuel is one of six children, and we know that six in scriptures is the number of man, is the symbol of, of the common symbol for man. Man was made on the sixth day. And it, it speaks to us, Christ bore the same nature as us, and Samuel was the sixth. He was a type of Christ. So here she was. Now she was blessed with these children, and she could focus her love and attention onto them as well as on Samuel as she did year by year. And so we read, and Samuel grew before the Lord in the end of verse 21. But then we read in verse 22. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So here's a great, another contrast. Samuel grew before Yahweh. Eli's sons are laying with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle. Now, what were these women doing? Who were these women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle? Need to go back to Exodus 38 and verse 8. Here in Exodus 38 and verse 8 we read, and this is talking about Bezalel who made all the furniture for the tabernacle and we're told that he made the laver here in verse 8. He made the laver of brass and the, foot, and the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the women assembling which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So here's the same phrase. Here's these women who assemble at the door of the tabernacle. Same phrases in, in uh, 2 Samuel. What were these women doing? Why were they assembling at the door of the tabernacle? Well, the word when it says they assembled means they served. So these women that were arranging themselves at the door of the tabernacle were doing some sort of service. In, Ezekiel, uh, in uh, Exodus 38, they were. Let's just come to Numbers chapter 4 and verse 24. What sort of service could women do? Numbers 4 and verse 24. Verse 22, 
Take also the sum of the sons of Gershon throughout the houses of their fathers by their families from 30 years old and upward until 50 years old shalt thou number them, all that enter in to perform the service and to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. This is the service of the families. I just want you to notice that point. It wasn't just the high priest. It was the priest wives and the priest children helped in some way. This is the service of the families of the Gershonites to serve and for burdens. And they shall bear the curtains of the tabernacle and of the tabernacle of the congregation, his coverings and the coverings of badger skins that is above and upon it and the hangings for the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the hangings of the court and the hangings for the door of the gate of the court which is by the tabernacle and by the altar round about and their cords and all their instruments of their service and all that is made for them, so shall they serve. So not just the priests. And these women, these women were in some way serving at the door of the tabernacle. Now, it really starts to open up a very interesting phrase, uh, women at the door of the tabernacle. I want you to come to Numbers 25, where the phrase is used again. Now, in Numbers 25, we have the terrible sin of the men of Israel being caught up with the Moabitish women at the instigation of Balaam. You know, Balaam had said, well, look, uh, every time I've been called to, to curse Israel, I bless them. But he said to Balak, I know how to get them. You send your beautiful women in. And that's what this chapter is all about, chapter 25. These women came and took the men away. Verse 1, chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab at the instigation of Balaam. And they called the people under the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before Yahweh against the sun, that the fierce anger of Yahweh may be turned away from Israel. Now, there were a thousand men that were actually hung up. There, a th and it doesn't say a thousand here. It actually says there were 22,000 that were affected by the plague. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says there were 23,000. Take 22 from 23 and you have a thousand men. A thousand men were hung up and they were leaders and they had been involved in whoredom with the daughters of Moab. We haven't finished. Verse 5. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of the men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation. Now that word congregation is a feminine word. It's a feminine noun. It's a female congregation. In the sight of all the female congregation of the children of Israel, who, and where were they? Who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Got these women again. The women at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. But now they're weeping. Why are they weeping? Because their husbands have been involved in all this immorality. And they're weeping at the door of the congregation. And when Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, and the priest saw it, he rose up from amongst the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and went in after the man of Israel into his tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through the belly, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Now we're going to come back to that verse because there's a very important connection with Samuel later on. Because Phineas, a faithful high priest, was the one who took the sons of Korah under his wing when their father was swallowed up in the earth. And Phineas trained the sons of Korah to be doorkeepers, to be gatekeepers, 
But here are the women. It's all happening. It's all happening, brothers and sisters, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the challenge by Korah. Let's just come back to Numbers chapter 16. It was at the door of the tabernacle. Now, Samuel was a descendant of Korah. Numbers chapter 16. And I'll, I'll open this up in more detail in a future study, but we're just opening the door a little bit at the moment. Verse 17. There was Dathan and Abiram, and then there was Korah. They all challenged Moses' leadership. Dathan and Abiram were consumed by fire and Korah and his family were swallowed up when the earth opened up. Just pick it up in verse 17. And take every man his censer and put incense in them and bring them to before Yahweh, every man his censer, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense therein and stood, where do they stand? At the door of the tabernacle. Again, we're right at the door of the... Everything seems to be happening at the door of the tabernacle with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of Yahweh appeared before them in a cloud. And then we're not going to read anymore. We know the story. We're going to go into it in more depth later on. They were destroyed and Korah was swallowed up. But we're just laying... Main Making the point, this is all happening at the door of the tabernacle. We've already seen Numbers 25 where Zimri brings the Midianitish woman in, into the door at the door of the tabernacle. And it's the door of the tabernacle is where the challenge, brothers and sisters, the ecclesia begins. Now, it does mean that door there. It does mean. What comes into this ecclesia, and it's always a challenge, but you see, before it becomes the door, it's actually the door of our minds. What we allow into our brains, we are bodies, we are tabernacles for God to dwell in, we're to be God manifestation as much as possible. What we allow into our minds then can corrupt and destroy. What we allow into the ecclesia can corrupt and destroy. So the challenge to the ecclesia always begins at the door of the tabernacle, the door of our minds. That's what this is all about. So what were these women doing? Back here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it was a, it was a permanent building. They didn't have to fold up the curtains and pack everything up and move on. Maybe there was some service, or was it just a tradition? Now, I don't know. You know, sometimes in the ecclesial world, we can just do things based on tradition because it's always been done in the past. But here they were. These women were standing here at the door of the tabernacle. And it was these women that were now being caught up with Hophni and Phineas. But, you know, we're told something else about these women. That in Exodus 38, we've already read it, that these, the labour that was made, the women that gave their looking glasses, now they didn't have mirrors. They had polished brass. So, sisters, if you've looked in the mirror before you come out tonight, you've, that's pretty modern. I just want you to imagine looking into a bit of polished brass. They brought them from Egypt, by the way. That was an Egyptian mirror, highly polished brass. And the sister said, look, instead of us having uh, our mirrors to look in, we're going to give them in the service of the tabernacle. That's really, that's really something, to give up your mirror in the service of the tabernacle. These women would have used these to maintain some form of, some form of pres 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 presentation in the face of searing wind and heat. Now, I believe, I'm not saying for a moment that sisters should look, should not care about how they look. They should. That's really important. 
And we say that to young couples. We say when young couples get married, uh, the young woman and the young man, they make themselves presentable to each other, then they get married. And if they tend to let themselves go, that's bad for the relationship. And so sisters, you know, we've got the other extreme where it says in, in, uh, in Peter that the women are the costly adorning of their hair and the putting on of apparel. But there is a balance, brethren and sisters. One can be overly dowdy or overly overdone. But these women took that which was for their presentation and they gave that in the service of the truth. It was a denial of fleshly lusts. The lava was used for the washing of the priests. That's that big bowl there. They would get blood on their arms and on their legs. They would wash their feet and their, their hands wash as they performed their offerings and the sacrifices. And the labor was used for the washing of the priests. And the women gave that which was for their beauty. They subjected themselves and gave that in the service of the truth. Now, Hophni and Phineas were defiling those women. These women who originally had submitted themselves for the service of the truth, now these women were being defiled by Hophni and Phineas. What a blatant sin, taking advantage of sisters in that way. The parts that were washed were told, the, uh, they had to wash, as I already mentioned, their hands and their feet, and that was made possible by the self-denial of faithful women in Israel. The women gave away that which was necessary for them to see how to comb their hair and make themselves look presentable. I want you to consider the spirit of the woman in Luke chapter 7 and verse 37. And our brother Neville Clark dealt with these women, but we're just coming at it from a slightly different angle tonight. Luke chapter 7. Verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet to find him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, not only just read that, I want you to think about that. Sisters, how would you feel? about washing somebody's feet, who hasn't even washed them beforehand, with tears, and then with your hair, drying those feet. That really is an act of submission. It's an amazing thing. Here's a woman, he, she's submitting herself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 39, now when the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it, they spake within themselves, this man, if he had were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of a woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And, of course, Jesus says in verse 44, look, you haven't done anything for me. She, she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped my feet with her hair. She's really subjected herself in humility. Then there's a woman in John chapter 12. Have a look at the woman in John chapter 12. Mary this time, the Mary of Mary and Martha. In verse 3, John 12. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Again, an act of submission. Now, that what's being said to us here, brethren and sisters, and the same has been said about these sisters in the wilderness, here were women who were prepared to subject themselves for the work of the truth. And it's not just women, by the way, where to be subject one to another, whether we're man or woman, where to be all subject one to another. But the emphasis here is being laid upon the women. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spike and art, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Because she did this, the ecclesial house, because this woman was prepared to subject herself, the ecclesial house 
was filled with this beautiful odour. And the odour of spoken art represents God manifestation. The work of the truth really prospered. One other passage, 1 Timothy 5.10. First Timothy five nine. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old. Now this is talking about they had an arrangement in the ecclesia, in the first century ecclesia. Women who were widows were looked after, the ecclesia arranged, if you like, a home for them. They could they could be cared for because they had no husband to care for them. Let not a widow be taken into the number under 60 years of age, having been the wife of one man. Verse 10, well reported of for good works, if she hath brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, and here it is again, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. I want you to notice that term, have washed the saints' feet. Now, once again, that doesn't literally mean that these sisters got down and every time a brother came into the house, they washed the feet. What it means is that these sisters were prepared to subject themselves in submissive ways that the work of brethren could be done. And that's that's Difficult for sisters. And brethren cannot get up on platforms. They can't go here and go there and do that unless they've got sisters that are supporting them. And those sisters, they are washing the feet of saints. They're washing the whole ecclesia's feet because they're allowing brethren, their husbands and other brethren, they're helping them to get on with the work. And that's what these women were doing here in the wilderness. They actually gave something that was for their personal beauty, for the benefit of the ecclesia. They subjected themselves for the benefit of the ecclesia. Now we are back at the door of the tabernacle. What were these women doing? What were they doing there? Well, these women at the door of the tabernacle in the time of Samuel were now caught up, unfortunately, with lying with Hophni and Phineas. What a horrible thing. When the great lesson about the work of these women is so beautiful, and that's what happens to these women here now in verse 22. But then we read in verse 23, And he said unto them, Eli says unto his sons, Why do you such things? For I hear of all the evil doings, dealings by all this people. And not a very strong rebuke by Eli. I mean, they're, high pri they're priests. And fornication and adultery were punishable by death. And all he can say is, well, I just heard about it. Just, you should stop doing it. Where was Eli? And what was he doing while this was going on? And, and that, that's a very sober lesson too, brothers and sisters, and particularly brothers. Brothers who are servants in the ecclesia need to keep an eye on what's going on in the ecclesia. Now, how could that have happened? in Eli's ecclesial environment. Well, lack of control and supervision. He just let anything happen. And lack of contact with his people. He wasn't there at all the Bible classes. He wasn't talking to people and finding out what was happening in their lives. He was just sitting on his seat, sitting back and saying, well, I'm the high priest and people do as I say. So lack of control and supervision. That Eli did not exercise sufficient control over his son is manifested from 1 Samuel 3, 13, where it says, Because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. The word restrain means he didn't snuff them out. He didn't disfellowship them. He should have kicked them out of the door. He didn't snuff out this flagrant challenge to the truth. And the other thing was lack of contact with his people. He just sat there at the door of the tabernacle. And as I said already, one must be sensitive 
to the prevailing ideas and doctrines, what's going on in the ecclesia. And we cannot know what is going on in the ecclesia, brothers and sisters and brethren, unless we are at the ecclesial activities, unless we're at the Bible classes. If we're arranging brethren, we need to be at more classes than other brethren. Not less, more. A sober lesson for serving brethren. Lack of contact with people. And so it says in verse 25, If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against Yahweh, who shall entreat for him? Now, Eli was able to make that observation. He says, look, if there was a problem between two men, well, the, the judges can solve that. They can, they can mediate. But when somebody sins against God, who's going who's gonna to mediate for him? Eli saw the need for a mediator. He saw that. But he didn't see what was going on with his sons. Because it says in the next verse, because, or in the end of that verse, because Yahweh would slay them. And this is the, 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 the narrator, the person who's recording this. It says that Yahweh would slay them because they hearken not to his word. And there comes a life, a time in the lives of people, brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, there comes a time when people are so turned away from the truth that much, will not respond to the truth, that God cannot do any more for them. They will not hearken to his word. Like Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened his heart. God didn't harden his heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God just left him to his devices. God withdraws his hand from their lives and God was withdrawing from the lives of these men and leaving them to their own devices. He would slay, they would die. But then we read a very wonderful and a positive note in the light of all that negativity. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favour both with Yahweh and also with man. And we're going to leave it there, brothers and sisters. But those things we discussed about the door of the tabernacle, we will come back to those when we took a look at the, the household of Korah. But we now understand what it means when it says the door of the tabernacle. We've got a responsibility to maintain the things of the truth and to know what's going on in the ecclesia. Might it be, brothers and sisters, that we might, like Samuel, grow in favour with God and with men.